I was a four-time loser before I realized I was in the wrong game. When I was in prison, I used to have occasionally a hopeful thought or a dream. It was that, hey, wow, what if I got through all this and figured this all out and I uh, could get out and make something cool happen, you know? Wow, I didn't even know I was a dreamer. And here I am. This journey, you can't make up. No. I mean, this, this stuff, you, you, you couldn't write a script to this, and yet here you are living it and breathing it. I remember being in prison late at night thinking, okay, things are really bad. If I ever get out of this, I'm gonna have a story to tell. This was the face of crime. Back then, uh, burglary, armed robbery, drug dealing, police beating up. Rumor is that you did a little time. Yes, like 15 years. So in less than a year's time, he's taken it from concept to recipe to store shelves. Dave's killer bread. Well, Lamb of Wheat called it the best bread in Portland. Just say no, it's bread on drugs. <laughs> Dave is the next big thing. Do you like Dave's Killer Bread? Yeah. Dave's Killer Bread made a killing. Forty million dollars this year alone. I just couldn't hardly be any better. In 2005, we had roughly 30-something employees. Over the next six years, we grew into now having over 250 employees and making 2,700 loaves of bread per hour, nearly 24 hours a day, seven days a week. even accountability, tough love. It's the way I look at people coming out of prison. They have to be eager to learn. They have to be humble. What are people doing with their lives? I've learned to accept that opportunity and make the most of it. Good seeds aren't just cute little flax seeds with halos. We really can make the world a better place. One loaf of bread at a time. Well, Dave, we get to do this again. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Dave and I had an interview was about seven, eight years ago, 2012, which began a lifetime friendship. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're really lots happened since then. Lots happened since then and a lot more to go. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're glad to be here. I've been to this conference before. It's one of the best I've ever been to for businesses. And so, first of all, thanks for the sponsors and the investors the ones that are going to give out the prize money at the end. And all the, uh, the, the contestants are winners, um, obviously, uh, because they, they made it through that, that, uh, that process, but they also, uh, they also learned a lot through the process. So anyway, it's great to be here. Dave, um, a lot has happened, and so I'm going to give you some questions, and, and we'll, we'll dialogue through all this. So one of the things, talking to outsiders, they look at Dave's Killer Bread, and they look at it as, you know, a tremendous success, and that, you know, you, you spent your time in prison, got out of prison, went back to the family baker, bakery, and became an instant success. Is that really how it went? There was nothing easy about Dave's Killer Bread, and it didn't happen overnight. I was 43 years old when I got out of prison that last time, and... When people ask me how long it took to make that, to, to create those recipes, I say 43 years. But when I got out, I was rocking and ready to go. What, were you in prison, I remember when I first interviewed you, I said three times, but you said no, four times. Uh, what, uh, what did you learn? What are some of the things you learned while you were in prison? Um, well, at first I was always trying, you know, the first few times I went to prison, I was always trying to learn to be a better criminal uh, because, you know, I was a dope addict and dope was, you know, the methamphetamine was more important to me than anything else. I could, as long as I had that, I was okay. So um, becoming a better criminal made me a better dope addict. Uh, but that didn't work out because I kept going back to prison. So 
on the fourth time, I hit a bottom, and I raised the white, you know, I waved the white flag, if you will. Uh, I surrendered, and I found humility, and it opened my mind up. Uh, made me realize that I was okay. Because, you know, I learned to be okay with me. And learning to accept yourself and, and go, hey, this is who I am, and now I can learn because I'm being myself. And I started, it opened my mind up to the possibilities, and it was crazy after that. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember you mentioned that, and your dad passed away in your last prison term, and, and you were able to also not blame other people for your actions. You just had been making bad choices. Yeah, I mean, you, you can sit around and blame people but, and, and make excuses, and that just gives other people the power. It, it just, you just give up your power when you do that. And uh, it's, it's so wonderful to be, to be in charge. So let's talk about the early days. You're out of prison, went back home, celebrated, correct? And, and put into this high position in the company. So tell us a little bit about the early days. The early days, I wasn't in a high, high position. Uh, my brother put me to work just where he should have um, at 12 bucks an hour, um, you know, on the line, filling in for absent bakers. I worked my ass off and I loved every minute of it. I lived in my mom's garage. I drove an 89 Ford Ranger. And that was the first couple years of Dave's Killer Bread for me. Um, I, was work I was still making an hourly rate, $15 an hour, working 40, you know, for 40 hours a week, a salary of $15 an hour. And I was actually working 80 hours or 100, you know, whatever it took. And, uh, that was Dave's Killer Bread for a long time. What, those early products, because you really got into innovation, into creativity, which you learned through a drafting class in prison. Yeah. So talk about the, the, actually, the creativity that you learned there, that you had creative ability, and then how'd you leverage it in that early, early product formation? Well, that was, that was the other thing. Uh, when you asked what I learned in prison, when my mind opened up and I was given the opportunity to go to trade school for computer-aided drafting, um, it just was, it was an eye-opener for me. It made me realize I was a lot smarter than I thought. It doesn't mean I was, you know, brilliant or anything, but I, I just realized that, hey, I'm okay, you know? And uh, I was knocking it out of the park on a regular basis. So, you know, learning as a drafter, you, uh, you essentially learn to replicate things that already exist and create a template. You have a template to work from to create a new product. And that's what I did in prison. I, I, I would turn a piece of furniture into a better piece of furniture. Um, and I did the same thing with bread when I got out. So you discovered there was a good seed in you. Yeah. <laughs> Which... If you know what a good seed, that's, that's not only a tattoo on my back, but it's also the name of one of my loaves of bread. Yeah. So going to the, lo the, the, the marketing and the brand of the bread, how did you get the name of the brand, Dave's Killer Bread? Uh, my brother wanted to call it, he kind of wanted it not to be an extension or to be, I, I always thought that I was going back to work with the family, I was going to be, that we're going to do this next phase of the family business. And we did, but it was kind of um, disguised under this Dave's bread, that's what he wanted to call it. And I created a loaf of bread called, my first loaf of bread that I made was called Blue's Bread, the second was Killer Bread. And... To me, killer bread was just the best bread you could make, you know? And uh, people agreed it was killer. And <laughs> next they still thing, do. Yeah. yeah, you got that knowing laugh right there. And uh, so that, it was a no brainer after. It just kind of just started rolling off the tongue, Dave's Killer Bread. Uh, so the company grew fast, rapidly, uh, with, with you creating these amazing breads. Um, started with cookies and went right into breads. <laughs> Um, and then in 2008 hit, recession hit, and for you guys to take it to the next level, you needed to get financing, and it was very challenging to get financing. How did you, how did you get through that? It was a kick-ass time for Dave's Killer Bread because, you know, we didn't even, we wouldn't have even noticed a recession if we hadn't have gone to get a loan. <laughs> You know, everybody's buying the bread. Nobody cares that it's a recession. They might not buy that, that, the yacht, but they're going to buy a loaf of bread that they love. 
Uh, so that didn't, we just kept growing through that recession time. But our bank at the time, who was the biggest bank in the world probably, uh, was looking at us as a, they didn't see us as a good risk and they, they didn't give us the loan that we needed to grow. We were in a position where we, in 2008, where we had to move to a bigger facility in order to take, take on Costco. And Costco was uh, who made me a millionaire. So, um, <laughs> you know, I worked my ass off at, in Costco, but the point is that uh, there was, we needed that, we needed to grow. And they weren't, you know, we've had to find a small bank who would take a chance on us. We had to find advisors who could help us figure out what we needed to do. And we needed to make a business plan. Yeah. We never had a business plan for that. And so talking about advisors, what did you learn through getting advisors at that stage? Your, how, how important was that? I mean, obviously it was critical at that point, but ongoing, what did you realize that you, you're not the smartest man in the, in the shed? Yeah, per, well, thanks a lot. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but, well, you know, I had learned that. I, I always knew that I wasn't the smartest guy around. Yeah. Uh, and so I was always looking for people that could make me better, you know, opportunities that, could make, could, that I could take advantage of. Uh, but it was, it was interesting that the family, we all had to kind of swallow our pride and go, we don't know that. We don't know enough to, to make this work. You know, we're, we're getting in un, uncharted waters, unfamiliar territory. We're dealing with the Franzes and the Orowitz of the world. Uh, and it's cutthroat. And we just, uh, we made a lot of mistakes, but we had, we had some help. So you got your loan, company is growing, um, you have a uh, team of passionate people, talent some talented people mixed in, and a lot, some family members. Mm -hmm. So there, what, there shouldn't have been any challenges to your success, <laughs> correct? Yeah, right, okay. Uh, that was all we had was challenges. And you know, I, I could just list, list them on not 10 fingers. I, I'd have to just go with my toes too. There's no way. <laughs> I could go on and on, but you know, you everything, every challenge has a solution, you know, or you you, you find something along the way, and um, we, I love that uh, that process where you challenge. But one thing that never really became, um, never never put a smile on my face was the family uh, dynamic. We just couldn't quite come to terms with each other. Um, I came out of prison, uh, this guy, you know, this cowboy shooting from the hip. My nephew had just gotten out of college. He graduated in three years, magna cum laude from, from Willamette University. And he, see, he comes out and he sees this guy coming from, uh, from prison and he's making all this way. Same time he got out, I got out. And <laughs> it Different was- Different paths. Yes. And, Damn, you yeah. know, and, uh, but you know what? We, we finally got some advice. We got, we got a guy, we got a family business shrink, uh, <laughs> so to speak. And it, we, we finally, through a lot of fighting, a lot of just really close to fisticuffs, we finally decided, we finally figured out that we were on the same page on a vision and a mission. And we didn't know what a vision and a mission were before that, you know? Um, and once we figured that out, we, we were able to sit in the same room together. Yeah, defining roles. But, and your relationship blossomed from that point on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what, well, you, you asked me earlier, it didn't. But when, when, when it was all said and done, and we went through all the craziness we went through, uh, we, we, we are good now because the, the heat's off. The pressure is off in, on that, in that way, you know. Yeah. What, did you guys intend to build a company as large as you did with the intention of selling the company? Never. I, I never even, never foresaw that until we got to a point um, where we, we didn't have the means. We, didn't, we had to bring on uh, private equity in order to grow to the next level and, uh, and to bring on expertise that we needed to go go further. So once that process started happening, my baby started to outgrow me. And once you get to a certain point, the way that you envision things in the first place changes because 
that's no longer your baby. And then it, it's like, okay, no, we're going to grow this and sell it. What, what, what was that like, letting your baby go at that time? It was rough. Uh, I, you know, I, part of it was I became so successful in a way that I didn't inv imagine becoming successful. And sort of a rock star mentality that went along with drinking to celebrate. Uh, drinking, celebrating, and uh, continuing to do my thing, but thinking I was doing well. But little things started to happen, little, little problems started to happen, and, and they always were way bigger because I was on the public, in the public eye. And it just got so ugly. And finally the pressure, even though I quit drinking uh, for a period, it got out of control. I had a, a mental breakdown in the streets that pretty much probably everybody in this room knows about. Yeah, yeah I got that call early that morning. <laughs> I was on my way to your house. I know, you were on my way to the house that day, yeah. Yeah. or the day before. Yeah. Wish you would have made it. Yeah. I would have wrestled you down. Um, I understand you had, uh, when you first started the company, and, and of course things were going well, and, and you started bringing on some of your, because you saw that you yourself um, could change and, 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 and start a new life. You started bringing on employees. At one point, about 30% of your employees were formerly I think it's still that way. Um, what I know, what I can tell, it's still that way. Uh, that's something that's, you know, it's the legacy of Dave's Killer Bread. But in, in the early days, we didn't go, well, let's hire 30% ex-cons. That's, that's crazy. You just hire the people, the right people for the job. Yeah. We, we knew that they could be amazing. You know, I was a pretty amazing uh, employee, so why couldn't other people be? Yeah, I had a, a chance to go and meet Dave at the facility during that time for part of our interview that we taped, and what I really learned from talking to some of the employees that had success that were there for a number of years and got, and got put into some management roles, what I saw that, and talk about giving them a chance is a real gratitude. The ones that really made it they were thankful for the opportunity because they didn't have the opportunities like they do today because of the economy and whatever. Yeah. So is there anyone that stands out or, uh, that you can look at and maybe the guy is still there or the person, the woman is still there? Wow, that's a, you snuck that one in I on I snuck me. that uh, one in. Any particular people? You know, I see lots of people. Uh, there might, you never know, there might be somebody in this room, but they, a lot of them have become executives in a bigger company. They've just made a career out of this. I don't have any specific examples right yeah. off the top of my head. Yeah, you know? yeah. But it was really wonderful to meet them and see their excitement. Yeah. And you guys did a great job of taking care of them and giving them that opportunity, even yeah. though not all of them succeeded. No, and, and you know, it's just like anything else. Um, you take a chance on everybody you, you hire. And we, we hired, one, there was a period where I think we hired 75 people in four months. Uh, we, we didn't have the ability to do it right, you know, but we did our best. And we had, the thing is, once they figured out that we were hiring ex-felons, that's all the temp, temp agencies would send us. So we're getting, I, when I realized that was happening, I was like, no, that ain't cool. But we, we uh, but that was one of the reasons why we had so many of them. And uh, I'm glad, glad it happened. Yeah. Um, when you talking to the audience, talking to the entrepreneurs out here, the early growth stage companies, what piece of advice would you give them? There's one thing that stands out or a few things coupled with that one thing. What would you tell them that you learned um, through this experience? Well, I think that the takeaway for me, and I knew this before it all happened, and um, essentially it's, you know, success for me wasn't Dave's Killer Bread. Um, it was a res you know, Dave's Killer Bread was a result of my success. And being in line with, with your you know, values and beliefs, finding humility so you're open to growth, and loving yourself through every struggle and so-called failure, to me, that's success. The rest is icing on the cake. I read that, by the way. So. Well, yeah, I, I, want, you know, I wanted him to share that because through the years, uh, we've had numbers of conversations and times together, and what came out was he was at his happiest before financial success came because he was passionate, he was purposeful, and that's why it was so hard for him to leave uh, when they sold the company because 
that was his passion and purpose, and he had to re yeah. redefine himself. Well, that was the pure, the pure part. You know, the first several years of Dave's Killer Bread, I was able to maintain what the, the happiness that I had before Dave's Killer Bread. Um, I was, in fact, I was even happier because now I was, I was making something that people were just reacting so strongly to, and people loved me, you know, and my bread, and um, that was amazing. But um, it, that can go the wrong way, and it did. So. And the other thing you talk about creativity because you sold the company, mm -hmm. and I asked you the other day. I said, "So what are you creating now?" Because you're a creative person. Because I create every day. There's always some solution I have to figure out and, or innovate, you know. And so talk yeah. about, about your life today. Well, uh, it's, it, there's so many things I do. Um, one of the ways that I healed from the incident in 2013, one, one of the ways I did that um, was I got into something that had nothing to do with me. It was uh, African art, African tribal art. And... So I went crazy with it. I have uh, 20,000 square feet full of it, you know. And uh, so I, I'm still managing that, dealing with, you know, the business of that. And there's problems and solutions every day. And it's, it's fun. It's not profitable, but it's fun. And uh, <laughs> so there's, uh, there's that. And... I get so many opportunities every day. Some, there's another opportunity, you know, that somebody comes up with. And um, for me, a problem is always waiting for a solution. And, you know, I have lots of experience um, finding solutions to problems. Yeah. And, the and some of the, sometimes the problem is actually how do you make a product that is going to kick ass? You know, that's a big problem. That is a big problem. And innovating uh, is a solution. You, the last few years, and you know, after, since you sold, you, African art has been a, a big passion. Um, I noticed you've really got involved with the community and with the nonprofits in the community. It seems like every other week there's, there's some, something you're giving back to. You talk about your giving back to the community. What does that mean to you? Really, it's natural. It comes from the heart. Even from the early days of Dave's Killer Bread, I realized that I had, uh, that I had value beyond uh, that my story had value, that my experience had value, and people reacted well to it. Um, I, I had the perfect storm of being able to go out and tell my story and promote my product at the same time. Um, I used to throw, I used to have, I'd bring boxes of bread and I'd throw them in the I audience. Thought I thought yeah, about it. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't yeah. represent the company anymore, so yeah. I, I can't do that. But that was a... That, if they didn't like what I said, they liked what I threw at them. So. <laughs> yeah, I always was a success. Yeah, that's great. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, that goes on and on. Uh, the, but it's never the material side that, that makes it. It's, it's that, over, that overarching sort of meaning that you have this meaning in your life. Yeah. And, I mean, coming from where I've been to where I'm today, it's phenomenal. And it, 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 it's bigger than me. You recently did a walk, and you do it every year, with, for NAMI. National Alliance for Mental Illness. Right. So talk a little bit about, because that's a big topic out there now, mental illness and being functional and managing through that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think everybody, there's almost everybody, I think, if not everybody, has experienced being mentally ill. Uh, you may not want to admit it, but you have been. And... Uh, and you had a moment, you know, and you've been depressed or whatever. I realize it's a complicated thing and everybody's got a different level of it. And some people function well on it. And then all of a sudden, you know, something happens. For me, it was stress, enough stress and enough resentment and things led me to a manic breakdown. So I understand for me how it works. Yeah. I understand that if I don't get that stress, I don't drink and I don't do whatever. I'm going to be okay. Um, other people have more serious problems, but it's it's not about you know the stigma's got to go. Yeah. That's the thing. There's it, the less there's a stigma about it, the more the more open our hearts and the more way you know more ways people can benefit. Great. Well, David, we're gonna first of all thank you. 
Thank you. And, uh, and thank you. we're going to take some time now uh, for some Q and A, and they're giving us they're graciously giving us some time for that. So if you guys have some questions, um, we'll toss you a box if you can catch it. That's the key. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Hi, yeah. I'm Hi. Ashley. What's and that? Ashley. 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 Chase, that's me. Uh-huh. Um, so my, are you sort of really hit home with me? Um, my older brother is in and out of jail, a heroin addict on the streets, and he's been about seven years since he's been like that. And we grew up super shared and really. Hold on, can you. Uh, can you um... can get, should I get rid of that? There you go. <laughs> so, my oh. Not doing well, and I feel like he thinks that this is who he is. This is his identity. That's his community. Yeah. He gets out of prison, out of jail, and goes right back to uh, his friends within that community. And I'm wondering, first of all, how is how can I, as a little sister, make him realize that this isn't who he is, and that he has so much more to offer the world? And second of all, that's tough. One. Can I organize for you to talk with him? <laughs> <laughs> how how would I do that? I can't, I can't say no to that, but hey, I, I will. The, the, you know, and that's really the solution. I mean, he's, it's a solution. The bottom line is everyone's got to find their own. Um, I've seen a lot of heroin addicts, be, you know, overcome. And, uh, you know, I, I was an opiate addict myself at one point. Uh, opiates suck, and they're really tough, but uh, and then, but the big problem in, in your brother's case, of course, is that that's his culture, and he doesn't see himself any other way. I, that's the way I was too. So, um, but I came to the end of my rope. The only way a person changes is that they suffer. They suffer enough, in my opinion. They suffer enough that they don't want to do it anymore. If he's going to continue to love, what, to li- if he likes what he does, it's going to be hard to change him. That's just my. Yeah, I'll slap him around for you. <laughs> Anybody else? I talked to this youngster earlier. Yeah. This is interesting. <laughs> How's it going? Um, so, how did you prepare your employees for executive positions? Because that's a very complicated subject, and a lot of companies go, like, hire and executive from another company. How did you go about that? Wow, man, that's, that's a long story, but a good question. Uh, in the early days of Days Could Have Read, when we got to the level of maybe 100 employees and we're starting to hire executives instead of just my brother, my nephew, and myself being the executives, uh, we made nothing but mistakes. That's all we did is make mistakes when we hired them. And it was, a, it was one disaster after another. They're always jackasses every damn time. <laughs> Truthfully, the hiring from within has always was always a better way in our company, but I know that we had some good success with outside too. And um, the culture just had to grow. It just had to grow. Would you focus on like team building activities or uh, uh, like mentorship pro for them, or what type of things uh, you do from within? Well, you know what, a lot of that stuff was, was not, by the time we were doing executives, I wasn't you know, hiring executives and building into the, the executive thing. I was more of a spiritual leader and the, the guy out, you know, I was a product developer, product uh, marketing, all right. marketing and uh, product development and, and quality control. So I can't say that I, I know exactly the solutions that we came up with there. Uh, but it was a lot of trial and error, I can say that much. And, we, and hiring from within was, was pretty successful for us. Thank you very much. Watching people grow. Can you toss that far? <laughs> Try. Let's check out your arm. Oh, that's pretty nice. Good. Oh! <laughs> Man, that was catchable. I just want to go back Love the jacket. Wow. <laughs> What's that? Oh, making this thing? Yeah. 
Oh. Ah. Wow. You're old in the I love your jacket. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so what, what in your life taught you balance? Balance? Do, do, yeah, Dr. Seuss mentions about life's a great balancing act. Obviously, you found balance. How did you find, or what is balance? Well, balance is, uh, you know what? When I used to be at the farmer's market in the early days, and I was working 100 hours a week, and loving it. I, I used to have people that would tell me, Dave, you need balance. And uh, I'd be like, no, I don't. Um, sorry, that's, you need balance. I don't. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, as time went by, I had family, you know, I developed, there's other things outside of the business. But in the early days, I can't say that balance would have done me any good. Uh, uh, but now, but now I do have balance. So uh, I'm not the. Believe me, I'm not the expert about balance. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Good answer. Anybody else? Way back there. Well, you always have a great product. What was great about you? What did you particularly awesome at that you think contributed to the success of Dave's brand? Huh. Well, I made a great product. <laughs> uh, uh, I think that's what uh, the ability to make that product came from a lifetime of failures and success, you know, not a whole lot of successes and um, being ready to create a great product and the ability, the, the desire, the passion to work hard and, uh, and, and not give up and, you know, because there was a lot of resistance to me, and you know, I, was, I was shooting from the hip when I got out. I, I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew I was gonna do something. And that wasn't always taken well. So the things that I value about myself, that I've learned, the lessons that I've learned, that make me capable of doing the things that I've done are humility, acceptance, and uh, as a, you know, the ability to grow and learn and from other people. And, uh, and courage, you know, and courage comes from humility and it comes from acceptance. So uh, I know that some people may recognize those attributes as part of a 12 step program, but uh, they're, life, they're life principles that work for me. I think out of the foundation that he just mentioned, uh, one of the, the successes that I see in him and I've seen through the years is he's not afraid to always be himself. He sh always shows up as Dave. He doesn't, he's not gonna come there and show up as anything but Dave. And to me, that's a strength, that's power. So. Thank you. Yeah. If I, if I was somebody else though, I wouldn't, may not be, right? That's I right. mean, sometimes you don't wanna show up because like, if, you, yeah. if I had been me 20, 30 years ago. You might not show up. I wouldn't show up as that guy. Or, or if they knew, if they told you, you need to show up this way, and yeah. you know it's not you. Well, that's, that was what it was. I was telling myself I had to be a certain way instead of being that, yeah. that guy. Yeah. I'm glad you're that guy. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you're that guy. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, Dave. Uh, I have a question about what you and you uh, worked with family members, a business partner. Uh, what kind of strategies and techniques do you use to like kind of get along. I heard that to get really along. get along. But how do you kind of you know weave around obstacles? You mean uh, the family business dynamics? Yeah. Uh, that was always a challenge. It never went away. But we found ways to mitigate it. Through uh, we actually we asked for help. We we asked for somebody to come in and referee and help us find solutions because we weren't finding them on our own. We were at each other's throats. Um, so that dynamic is really hard. And for me, again, humility and acceptance are really powerful. If you don't think you're all that, you know, and you're open to other people's sides of things, as well as uh, going, well, this is what it is. Uh, and, you know, not trying to think that you're, that's, it's something that isn't then you, if you're looking at things exactly as they are, 
that's perfect. And you, maybe somebody else isn't, but you accept that too. We have time for one more question. This guy right here. If, Thank you. No, I had, it was, a, it was a lot of fun to create. Uh, I got out chomping a bit to do something, and I had been in prison learning a, a trade, drafting. Um, as a drafter, you create products, you, in a sense. Uh, and that's what I just took the same kind of mindset. So, yes, I went around and I found ingredients that, I looked for ingredients. I, looked, I went to Bob's Red Mill, um, everybody knows Bob's Red Mill, and I looked, it, it, I, I went through and I just started picking stuff out, and I was like, this, this would make good, good product. Um, and I, I looked at what other people were making, and I learned to replicate those products so that I could know what I was trying to beat. And uh, that's what I did, I just, I used scientific method, you, four or five batches uh, with slightly different, each batch is slightly different than the other one, and you, you keep records and you, you learn from each batch you make. And um, finally, we took it to the farmer's market and I got to test market it on people. I said, it's a perfect world. So test marketing is crucial. And well, thanks, Dave. Thanks, everyone. Uh, and thanks to the sponsors. Thanks, Edco. Thank, thank you to the investors and the money you're going to be kicking out here at the, uh, at the end of the day tomorrow. And uh, we really are thankful for the opportunity to be here. Thanks. Thank you.